Today I'd like to talk about ancestral curses and generational curses, ancestral guilt, and those kinds of things. Let's look at curses first. It's everybody's favorite topic. <laughs> I want to talk about how, it, very briefly, how a curse works. There's only really one way that you can make a curse work. If you really wanted to curse somebody and you wanted to hex them, there's only really one way to make it work. A lot of people are superstitious about their magic, and that includes curses. And people, even cursors, think that, oftentimes believe that, they have some sort of magic power that's going to have energy that's going to come in and, and wreak havoc on another person. Or that they're going to make demons or spirits come and haunt them and, and harm them and things like that. That's superstitious. That's You can believe that all you want, but none of that's actually happening, even if it appears to be. The only way a curse works is if you are capable of convincing a person's deep mind to curse themselves. This is usually done through ritual, through some sort of ritual. And what happens is the, if somebody is really good at this, they can go way deep in the mind of the victim and gently convince them that they are either dying or that they have bad luck or bad things are happening to them or that their relationship is breaking up. It's like a post-hypnotic suggestion that they, that they implant into their deep mind through telepathy and usually through some sort of ritual, but sometimes it's through direct means. And usually slowly over time, they just keep dripping these negative suggestions onto the victim. And if the victim uh, accepts those su suggestions, they will go ahead and, and be cursed. And that curse will, will take, take on a life of its own. But it's not because of something that, that is necessarily being sent to the person. That's the thing. There's no big energy balls. There's no big demons. There's none of that. It can seem that way. You can convince the person that that's what's happening, but that's not what's happening. What's happening is the person is cursing themselves through suggestion. Now, there are people that cannot be cursed just like there are people that cannot be hypnotized. So like a stage hypnotist, when they are choosing people to come up on the stage, they have ways of determining whether somebody can be hypnotized by them or not. And they only bring the people up on stage that are the most vulnerable to that, to being hypnotized. A similar way with curses, some people just can't be cursed because they have a strong enough mental constitution they have a strong psychic immune system, and so they reject any negative uh, suggestions that come their way. They, they recognize that there's a foreign influence that's trying to, you know, to wreak havoc on them, and, the, and it just rejects it. It's like, a, it's like an immune system. And that's why we say, put, you know, when you put up your protections and things like that, that you're not vulnerable to curses. And what, you're, what that really means, in effect, what's happening is those shields are acting as mental posts inside your mind to alert your deep mind, no, don't accept those thoughts. Those thoughts are not for you. And really, that's all that's happening. It would almost be easier if, if it were that you were combating, you know, lightning bolts or something like that of psychic energy. What really is the, the most difficult thing to combat is to, is to keep that, that deep mind invulnerable. The majority of the hexing that goes on, though, doesn't happen from external sources. It happens from the person themselves. And the, one of the reasons why this is true is because of generational curses. Now, there are absolutely, it's true that there are families that have been cursed by magicians or witches or covens or things like that. That has absolutely happened. But we tend to keep those curses alive from generation to generation. So even if there was an actual curse placed on a family, that, that curse usually dies after a generation or two. But the families tend to oftentimes keep it going on their own, on their own. Now, a lot of those generational and familial curses don't have an origin from somebody hexing them or cursing them. They've happened organically within the structure of the family. So, 
you know that this is true. This look at look at look at how a family might have poverty, and then they teach that habit of poverty to their children, and then those children teach the habit of poverty to those children, and so on and so on. You can hear it was like, oh well, you know, the Smith family, we never have money. We've always had we've always had money problems, things like that. The Smith family always has had problems with marriages. Our marriages never work out, and and so they have like these laws, and they and they just they fall right in line with those laws, whether or not those things have been placed upon them by an actual curse from from outside the family, or whether they sp- sprang up organically. It doesn't really matter because the curse is there. The curse is there. Now, a lot of these curses come from ancestry. You know, a lot of the abuse cycles in families started many, many, many generations prior, and they just kept perpetuating and perpetuating and perpetuating. It works like what, what's called an egregore, and an egregore is any kind of group thought form. So it's usually thought of in, in a, a magical sense, like when a group forms together and they have a group thought form. That's called an egregore, and oftentimes that egregore works within a within a magical community as sort of like their guardian spirit or or th- th- things like that. But familial curses have their own egregore, and those egregores are very much a part of the generations of problems that you can look back. I mean, if you look at like maybe the Kennedy family, they have an egregore that seems to have constantly gotten them in trouble again and again and again and again. And so those those things are real. Those things are real, regardless of how they originated. It really doesn't matter how they originated. What matters is that they can be broken. They can be broken. And we'll talk about that in a minute. I'm going to talk about ancestral guilt as well. For instance, slave owners. So say your family had slave owners, like in America, even just a few generations ago, if your family were slave owners, then you have the egregore of that racial guilt on you. You just do that generational kind of karma that even though you don't agree with that personally, even though you don't have anything to do with what your ancestors did, you still carry that. You still carry that. It's it's like a genetic thing that you're carrying the guilt for all of the atrocities that were uh, meted out on onto those slaves by your by your family, and you get to you you are the happy recipient. <laughs> you won the grand prize of all of that ancestral guilt. And now, if you look at crime families, crime families, even though maybe several generations after that crime family has been in power and you're not a criminal and you don't agree with that, and maybe there's been a couple of generations where that hasn't been going on, you still can carry the guilt of that. You still can carry the guilt of 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 the, the crimes that were perpetuated by your family. So those things have to be looked at and dealt with. And so a lot of times when things are not going your way and you just you cannot get out of negative patterns, it's not because you're doing something wrong. It's because you picked up on thought forms and egregores and things like that from your family that you didn't even know were there, that you didn't even realize were there. And those things can be lifted. And, and must be lifted. Those things must be lifted. You can look at this even to the nth degree to something like what many religions might call original sin. Original sin. That's the beginnings of ancestral guilt, Was a, what, what they call original sin. Sin doesn't necessarily mean something other than mistake, right? So original sin in that regard only means the beginning of the point at which we decided to feel separate from our Creator. At, at what point did we feel that we wanted to consider ourselves separate from our Creator? That was original sin. Let's use the Bible as the, the creation myth. That first creation myth in Genesis, well, there's two. There's Genesis 1 and Gen- Genesis 2. The first creation myth was, called, was about God creating the soul. The the second one wasn't so much about God creating the soul in my perspective. That Adam and Eve myth where there's the serpent in the garden and then they get expelled from the garden, that particular myth, that was the creation of the ego. That was the creation of the ego. The ego is that part of the mind that wants to think it's separate from its good. 
And that was the beginning of all generational curses. And again, it didn't happen in time so much as it happened in consciousness. So look at it this way. When in that garden, you had the voice of God, that character, you had a serpent, you had a masculine, fem- a masculine figure, Adam, and a feminine figure, Eve. And all was fine. And then this voice tells them, you can have anything you want in this garden except for this tree. Have at it. Enjoy it. But if you eat from this tree, you're going to die. Well, what do you do when somebody tells you don't do something? Automatically, you want to do it, right? So basically, this voice that was supposedly God was gaslighting Adam and Eve in this garden knowing full well that they're going to do what they said not to do. And so the serpent there, which has always been, you know, sort of like shown as being the evil one, the serpent is the only one that didn't lie in that story. Whenever you look at these ancient these ancient scriptures, look at the occult mystery there. It's so obvious. I mean, if, if you just look at it just objectively, it's so obvious the writers of that were putting some wisdom in there for you to question. Why would God lie? Why would God lie and say, oh, you're going to die? The serpent's the only one that said, no, you're not going to die. If you eat it, then you're going to see things like God sees things. And you're going to see things the way God sees things. And if you don't do that, you're just going to be an automaton. So how do you want it? Which way do you, would you like it? And so in that regard... The voice, if you look at it just from that perspective, the voice for God wasn't really God. The voice of God in that respect was the the voice of the ego, the creation of that idea of separation. In that story, Adam fell asleep. And nowhere else in that book does it say Adam woke up. So that was the beginning of this dream. That was the beginning of this dream. And the rest of the book is just basically catastrophe after catastrophe after catastrophe. It was the beginning of the catastrophe of this world, basically. So that just to say that the ideas of of I'm separate from God, I'm separate from my good, I'm not good enough, were then taken from generation to generation to generation to generation. So you don't have to feel bad that things don't work out for you because you just picked up on all of that from from your parents who picked it up from their parents all the way back to the beginning. So whether it's so no matter what horrible things your families have been involved with whether they were um really obvious like slave ownership or crimes or murders or you know things like that keeping women down and and uh, abusing children or sexual abuse all of that kind of stuff all of those things are types of generational curses where somebody learned it from their parents who learned it from their parents who learned it from their parents. There's several different kinds of curses going on here. Some of them were placed maybe on a family from a witch or a magician or or a coven or a lodge. That, that does happen. It's not as common as people believe, but it does happen or it has happened. And then the, just the generational curses based on ancestral guilt, based on this whole idea that I'm not good enough and that we're not enough. And and then coming together within a family lineage of not enoughness. And and so it's not only you trying to prove to, to, to the world that you're not good enough. It's you've got a whole familial heritage of trying to prove that that nobody's good enough and that nothing ever works for us. When you have a bloodline of habitual thought patterns, it can seem impossible to break out of that. It can seem impossible to break free from that. But let's break free from that. First of all, think of it this way. God, if you will, the, the, not the one in the Garden of Eden, because I don't believe that was God. <laughs> I personally don't. And I don't think that we're supposed to believe that that was God. You know, if you look at the way that story was written, it's you should be able to question that. You should be able to question that. Why would God lie? God wouldn't lie. God, God is all truth. But if you think about the true creative principle of the universe, which is all love, that creative principle has no limitation and does not exist in time. So anything that is created by that creator doesn't exist in time and has no limitations. That way, who you are as a soul has existed forever. 
There is no you you are not a new soul or a young soul or an old soul. There is none of that. There is no young, old, and new in the mind of God. There is only perfection. There is only eternality. So you are an eternal being. Therefore, you were there. You were there when all of these curses happened. You were there. No matter what's going on, if it affects you now, you were there at the beginning. So you're not being victimized by some many generations of things, and then you're just this innocent little creature that came in and had nothing to do with it, and oh, now what do I do? In reality, you were part of the whole thing. You've been reincarnating into uh, existence, if you, is, a, is a way of looking at it, for eons, and you keep re- recreating your, your life so that you, until you can unravel this. And you don't have to wait for the next life to unravel it. You can do it today. You can unravel these generational curses today. You can be free from all ancestral guilt, all generational curses today. And it does not have to take a long time. If you if you read a lot of these so-called experts on generational curses, they'll take, tell you that this will take a long time and it's a lot of effort and you know you probably won't make it. And that's not true. Uh, that is absolutely not true. It is not God's will for you to be cursed by anything, whether it be from generations gone by, whether it be from a person cursing you in this life, whether it be from that story of the Garden of Eden. It is not God's will for you to live in a cursed condition. Therefore, you can't. You can't ultimately be cursed, but you sure can believe you're cursed. And and just like I said, that's how curses work. They work by your deep mind believing that it's so. Your deep mind doesn't die when your body dies. So if you keep perpetuating the belief that you're cursed, then you're going to just keep reincarnating into that curse until you wake up from it. So you don't need that anymore. We're going to recognize, wait a minute, somewhere along the line, I accepted the idea that I'm cursed. Somewhere along the line, I allowed that thought form to have room in the depths of my consciousness. Therefore, I can unlearn that. I can disassociate myself from that. I can be freed from that today. So how do you do that? Here's a way. Start looking at what's not working for you habitually. Why would you think that you're cursed? What is it about your family, especially your family of origin, even if you're adopted? Maybe you were foster care, whatever it was. What is it about what you know about your family that keeps reminding you of the problems that you have in this life? Maybe your family has always had problems with marriage. Maybe your family has always had problems with money. Maybe your family has always had problems with health. Maybe there are certain things that you tend to carry on from previous generations. So you want to, first of all, just identify those things. And then, and then start asking yourself, what are the underlying thoughts about myself, my family, and the world that keep these things in place. And you can just take out a piece of paper and start writing those thoughts down. The reason why everybody in my family is always dealing with um, obesity problems is, and then just write them down, you know, you know, bad genetics or we're not good enough or, or whatever it is. Just, just write them all down. Just get them all out on paper. And then you can call on your higher power, whatever you want to call it as, it doesn't really matter. You can call it as God. You can call it as goddess. If, you ha- if you're working with a deity, it, it doesn't matter. Whatever, whatever you truly believe to be your higher power, and you can bring them into this situation and just say, look at this list of things. Look at this list of things. I'm willing to be freed from these things. And then, and then you can be working with that power, working with that also that inner guidance, and start listing the alternative thoughts that you want instead of those things. So, for instance, the reason why I'm always uh, having a problem with obesity is because of genetics. And you can just say, my genetics are now prone to health. My genes are now prone to health. My body is now prone to healthiness. Again, it's not about, you know, with weight, it shouldn't be about a number necessarily. It shouldn't be even about aesthetics. It should be about what's healthy for you, right? Uh, maybe it's a marriage, you know, nothing ever works out for us. All our, our marriages are always destructive or whatever. And, and you can just say, 
all of my relationships now reflect perfect love. Those kinds of thoughts. Whatever it is, one by one by one by one. And what you have to do is find the one that is the kingpin for the whole curse. There's going to be one. It's usually something like I'm I'm insignificant or I'm not good enough or nothing you know nothing good is for me. So one of those thoughts. At some some point, your your whole family brought bought that thought. And once you find that kingpin, and you can switch that kingpin thought around to I'm perfect the way God created me. God loves me just the way I am. I have everything that I need at every moment of time and point of space. Everything works out for me beautifully. Those kinds of thoughts. Once you can find a way to replace that one thought, that kingpin thought with the with the actual truth, you'll notice that the that the curse tends to just unravel before your very eyes. Now, can you do rituals? to remove these generational curses? Absolutely you can. You can even just do that simple lemon uncrossing spell. That works beautifully on generational curses. You don't have to just use it for personal curses. You, if, if there's a generational curse that you know that is happening, and especially if you know in regards to what part of your life it's, it's happening, use that, uh, that lemon uncrossing spell or something like it, and then also be very diligent that you do not fall back into the habitual thought pattern that, that is perpetuated by the curse, whatever that thought pattern is. Nothing ever works for me in romance. Oh, everything works well for me in romance. Because you're that way, you're taking a stand. You're saying, "Well, I'm going to be the first. To, I'm going to be the first generation that moves out of this, right? I'm going to be the first generation that, that has a successful relationship. I'm going to be the first generation that gets out of the, you know, the diabetes curse. I'm going to be the first generation that that gets out of the bad luck or or whatever your family tends to go through again and again and again and again and again. You're going to say, "I'm the one that breaks free of this," because when you break free of it, it starts to unravel for your entire family. Once you can unravel it for yourself, it unravels it for everybody. Now, that doesn't mean that those people in your family won't necessarily still perpetuate it based on habit, but the egregore starts to lose its power over everybody. So you breaking free of the of the curse is good for you, but it's also good for everybody in your family. If the curse has been around for many, many generations, remind yourself that so have you. You do not have to be victimized by this curse. You are not a victim. You are part of the solution because you were there when, it, when that curse started. And you can be there now to, to be the, the one that ends the curse. Remind yourself frequently, it is not God's will for me to be cursed. Therefore, I cannot be cursed. Infinite intelligence does not will for me to be cursed. Therefore, it is impossible for me to have a curse. And so then you have to just be very vigilant about keeping your mind focused on the truth rather than going into the habitual thought patterns that have been the seed of thought of this curse for maybe many generations. You can do it. You can do it very, very easily. Remind yourself that it's easy for you. It's easy for you to overcome this. It is easy for you to be free. It is very easy for you to be free. Remember that to spirit, there is no difficult and easy. There is no big and small. Generational curses are no no bigger of a problem than a hangnail to spirit. Okay, it's all the same. One problem is is just as easy as another problem. So you lean on that. You lean on the fact that you that infinite spirit has your back. All right? And you do not need to put up with with any of it. You don't have to put up with any generational curses, any ancestral curses, any ancestral guilt. You can remind yourself, I am free from all ancestral guilt. I am innocent. I am innocent. I'm the innocent child of the universe. I'm an innocent extension of perfect love. And only perfect love prevails in my life. And remind yourself of that again and again and again. Wake up with a thought like that on your mind and go to bed with a thought like that on your mind. That is the way that you break these generational curses. It's not just the ritual and alone that can break the curse. It's your habitual thought patterns that will break the curse because it is habitual thought patterns that is a curse. Remind yourself of that often. It's not because somebody's got some sort of you know, powerful crystal or something that, that, <laughs> that somebody can be cursed. It's because they were able to, in one way or another, 
allow you to make a thought about yourself that habituates and that that then causes problems and wreaks havoc on your life. As obsessive as those thoughts can be, you be that obsessive with the cure. Every waking moment, you just find you find whatever uh, chant, affirmation, or incantation cl- that clicks for you, and you keep coming back to it again and again and again. I am free. I am completely free, free, prosperous, and healthy. I am a divine child of the infinite, and I have freedom and love. Right? I am a sovereign being. I am a child of royalty. I'm a divine child of royalty, and I have a divine heritage, and I claim that heritage now. And that heritage, remind yourself, does not include being cursed. It's impossible for your, for your soul to be cursed. It is impossible for your soul to be cursed. Why would God allow such a thing? that only exists within the realm of this hallucination and nightmare that all occurred because we decided to listen to that voice back in that garden. The idea that we would have to go to a tree outside of ourselves to see things the way God sees things, that was the curse, that and of itself. The idea that the, the second that she reached for the apple, it wasn't the apple. It was the idea of like, wait a minute, I don't, ha- I don't see things the way God sees things. <gasps> oh, I better go outside of myself to try to get something. That was the curse right there. This idea that was the gaslighting that that voice in the garden had. The idea that you need something outside of you in order to fulfill you. Because when you were created, you were given everything you need. And you still have everything you need. And so anything that, that is reflecting that idea of, oh, I'm not enough, i got to go outside of myself to, to get something, that is the curse. And that's, you, you're going to keep perpetuating it in one form or another, whether it be, um, you know, uh, like I said, familial curses, whether it be ancestral guilt, whether it be any of it, any of those curses are all a result of you believing erroneously that you don't have enough, that you were not created good enough, that you were not created a complete being, and that you need something outside of yourself, or that you're a victim, and that you can be victimized, because you cannot. You cannot be victimized, not on, not on a soul level. And the soul level is the only thing that matters here, because if you recognize who you are as a soul, the rest of it will take care of itself. So get on that. Get on that right away. Look and see where are the ancestral curses. What What is it that I feel like is too big for me? And look and see, wait a minute, at some point, at some point in my, in my existence, I bought a thought. I allowed a thought form to exist in my, the depths of my consciousness that is now wreaking havoc on my life. I don't want it anymore. Now, even if you don't have the, the ability to, to, to locate that on your own, you can ask that infinite intelligence locates those curses, locates those thought forms, and, and brings them up so that you can make the decision not to carry them anymore and allow them to be released, allow them to be taken, allow them to be taken from you. And then it's only your job, your only job is to be very diligent about what your conscious mind is thinking, because that's how you reprogram that. That's how you plant the new seeds. You don't have to worry about pulling out those weeds. The infinite spirit will do that for you as long as you're willing to have them pulled out, but you have to be willing. And that's where those rituals come in. And that's why that that lemon ritual is so easy to do, but it's so, so powerful. And that's basically just making a very clear statement to your deep mind and to the universe that I'm willing for these for these curses to come up so that I can let them go. And all you have to do is say, I don't want to keep those. I don't want to keep those curses. I'm willing to let them go. And I'm willing to keep my mind focused on exactly what the truth is. And I'm not going to go back down those roads. And I'm not going to reestablish those curses for myself. Hopefully that was interesting and helpful for you. Blessed be. (music) 